I'm Peter Ridd, and I've been researching the Great Barrier Reef since 1984. Australia is the land of extremes. One year it'll be drought, the next it'll be fire, and then it will be flood. All of these events are devastating to the natural environment. Well, the Great Barrier Reef is no different. An event such as cyclones can kill an area the size of Belgium or Vermont or Tasmania just overnight. Bleaching events will take a little longer, but will certainly destroy huge amounts of coral. Crown of Thorns starfish may take many years, but can destroy a large fraction of the Great Barrier Reef's coral. Now the difference between land and sea is that the natural disasters on land are easily seen and are recorded historically. But for the reef, which is below the water, any disaster is hidden from view. We would never say that bushfires never occurred, say, before 1770, for example. But for the Great Barrier Reef, because it is under the ocean and there were no real significant observations before the 1960s, it's sometimes tempting for some people to say bleaching or crown of thorns starfish never occurred before the 1960s. But is this because... Nobody was looking before the 1960s. Now, in some regards, Captain James Cook was the first scientist to study the reef. He was sent from England to Tahiti to observe an eclipse, and from there he was supposed to go over to Australia and explore the east coast. And he ended up bumping into the reef, literally, and taking some observations. But it wasn't for well over a hundred years after that that the first real scientific expedition occurred to the Great Barrier Reef. And that was by Sir Maurice Young, who was sent over by Britain's Royal Society in 1929. But there was only one of him and a few helpers and a small boat. And in those days, they really didn't have the technology. They didn't have scuba gear. They didn't have outboard motors even. They certainly didn't have satellites and aeroplanes to survey the reef. So, of course, they were only able to just scratch the surface in those early first expeditions. Marine science didn't really get going until the 1960s and 70s, although there was a little research station on Heron Island in the 1950s. James Cook University, which has a prestigious marine biology department, didn't start until the 1960s. And the Australian Institute of Marine Science didn't really get going until the end of the 1970s. So we didn't know a great deal about the reef until the 1960s, especially as it was completely hidden underwater. And there really wasn't the technology to study the reef before the 1960s. So perhaps it's all not surprising that it wasn't until the 60s that scientists first started to tell the world about the doom of the Great Barrier Reef, which was being eaten by Crown of Thorns starfish. And this had never happened before. This is a line that's still used to this day. But, you know, it's an incredible coincidence, isn't it? That it's not until the scientists arrived that simultaneously, for some reason, these plagues started to occur and that it had never happened before. And also coral bleaching events apparently never happened before the 1980s. A very eminent Great Barrier Reef scientist once said, a critical issue here is that these bleaching events are novel. When I was a PhD student 30 years ago, regional scale bleaching events were completely unheard of. They're a human invention due to global warming. This is seemingly an incredibly powerful argument. If these horrific mortality events didn't occur before the 1960s or 70s, then clearly there's something that we humans are doing to damage the reef. But the thing is, how would we have known if something had happened, say, in the 1920s? There were no scientists studying the reef. There wasn't the technology to do it properly. We couldn't see widespread mortality of the reef. Nowadays, we use satellites and aerial surveys. So you have to wonder whether the reason that these mortality events have apparently just occurred is because we've only just started to look. In fact, the rest of this series, we're going to actually demonstrate that bleaching has been occurring for millennia, and the same for crown of thorns starfish. We can actually find the skeletal remains of starfish buried deep in the reef from thousands of years ago. And it's got to be remembered that this area, even in the 1960s, was a very remote part of the world. 
But if you go back to the 1930s, it was incredibly remote. Just to give you some idea, consider the highlands of New Guinea just to the north of the Great Barrier Reef. When do you think first contact was made with a huge population of a million people living in the highlands of New Guinea? Europeans didn't discover that area until the 1930s, less than a hundred years ago. Those people, a million people, knew nothing of the outside world and the outside world knew nothing of them. And those people were only discovered largely because of the invention of aeroplanes that came onto the scene in about the 1930s. They flew over that inland plateau and saw a thriving population of people here. So do you reckon in the 1920s, if we didn't even know about a huge population of people, do you reckon that we would have noticed a bit of coral bleaching or some crown of thorn starfish eating some coral? And if we did, would we have cared? And who would you have reported it to? There were, no, there were no universities, there were no marine science institutions within thousands of kilometres. Now, massive death from crown of thorn starfish or bleaching is not the only spectacular event that occurs on the Great Barrier Reef. There's also mass coral spawning events when over a few days almost every coral on the reef releases a massive number of eggs, forming slicks on the surface that you could hardly miss. And yet this incredible event was only discovered to science in the 1980s, but it had surely been going on since time immemorial. We would never claim that coral spawning had never occurred before the 1980s just because we didn't know about it. And yet that's exactly what we do with craniform starfish plagues or coral bleaching events. So the way we look at the reef is affected by the fact that the reef is very young and the technology to observe it properly really hasn't been around for more than 50, 60 or 70 years. But in those early days of research, it was correct to worry about the reef. There was a lot of coral being eaten by crown of thorn starfish. We didn't know why and we didn't have any idea about the recovery or anything like that. It would have actually been a crime not to have worried about the reef. But 50 or 60 years of research has shown that it's actually in very good shape. Let's not forget that this year, 2022, with the highest coral cover on the Great Barrier Reef since records began. And of all the 3,000 reefs of the Great Barrier Reef, every single one still has excellent coral. The coral amount may change from year to year. It does change from year to year but we haven't lost a single reef. So we must be a little circumspect about the last 50 years of doom stories about the reef. Things actually look quite encouraging. <laughs>